So we have the privilege of uh, having three very distinguished and very knowledgeable speakers uh, to talk about the domestic scene in Ukraine. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Andreas Umland uh, from the Institute for Euro-Atlantic Cooperation in Kiev, and he's also affiliated with Kiev uh, Mahila University. Uh, Dr. Umland is an expert on the far right. Uh, one of his uh, many distinguishing features is that he has an ongoing dispute with the uh, with the Russian theorist Dugin, uh, so that in many ways it speaks to the quality of his character that, uh, that he's despised by many in the wrong circles in Russia. Uh, but he's also been very close to the ground uh, on, with respect to political events in Kiev, uh, and so he can very much give us the close regional perspective that we need. We have to talk about the economic situation, uh, the premier expert on the Ukrainian economy, Dr. Uh, Anders Osland, uh, from the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Uh, and Anders is finishing a new book uh, on Ukraine called What Went Wrong and How to Fix It, Ever Practical. Uh, and Anders has advised governments in Ukraine for the entire post-independence period, in my view. There's really no greater expert on both the politics and the political economy and the economics of Ukraine than Anders. Uh, finally, we have Taras Kuzio uh, to speak about the, the military situation. Uh, Taras is currently a research associate uh, at the University of Al Alberta, the center, the Canadian Institute for Ukrainian Studies. Uh, and without further ado, I think we'll move to, we'll start with uh, Andreas. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Um, before starting, I'm supposed to speak here about domestic politics in, in Ukraine to give a short introduction to that. I don't think that actually domestic politics is um, the most dramatic and the most important thing to talk about uh, Ukraine today. Um, I've been uh, contacted many times before the parliamentary elections in Ukraine by, um, by journalists and also German journalists who asked me what would the... Um, what would the parliamentary elections change in the conflict between Russia and Ukraine? And I said very little. And, um, and so the, the main story I think today is, um, is actually about the Russian-Ukrainian conflict on, about which I'm not gonna uh, talk here about because we will have more presentations on, on that. Um, uh, um, and um, so my, my uh, um, so although I think that the, what, what's happening uh, domestically in Ukraine now is quite dramatic, there's an even more dramatic, dramatic story uh, going on that um, has, has more implications for the future of Ukraine than the purely um, domestic um, uh, uh, aspects. Um, uh, that also concerns um, domestic, uh, the, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine also concerns uh, uh, domestic uh, issues in, in Ukraine, not just the, um, the conflict in eastern Ukraine, but also the investment, the business climate in, in the whole of Ukraine. It also concerns the attitudinal, the deep attitudinal changes that are going on in, um, uh, in the Ukrainian population and the, the, the sti I'm, I'm still, we still have to wait for the research, what, what is actually uh, responsible for the deep changes in the attitudes of Ukrainians towards the EU, the NATO, towards Russia, but, but, but my impression so far is that it has actually to do more with the conflict with Russia than with the, uh, with the Euromaidan and the, with the domestic changes. So I want to talk here about the um, uh, what, what has been happening in the last year in Ukraine and I want to make here the somewhat bombastic statement that what we are observing currently is a social revolution. It is a, a deep and fast change in various uh, fears of, uh, of Ukrainian society and its institutional structure. There will be a new constitution, a decentralization of Ukraine in its societal structure. There, will be, there, is, uh, there has already emerged a new party spectrum. Media, civil society play a different role than uh, a year ago, and also in culture, in the as I mentioned already, in the attitudes of the Ukrainians towards the outer world, towards their own country, that is all happening. That is deep. That is fast. That's why I'm I'm using here the uh, the term revolution, and um, I think that's that's something that I think should be um, should be taken into account. And we have a different situation now than in 2004 when there was the so-called Orange Revolution, which I think was not a revolution. It was a civic action of, of mass protest, which uh, which changed somewhat Ukraine, but not to the extent um, um, that uh, one would have hoped for, maybe, and arguably, maybe. And uh, I wonder what, what the other Ukraine specialists here in the uh, today and in and, and, and the audience think is maybe it's even a larger change in the Ukrainian 
Western society than the 1990 Granite Revolution that, um, uh, of course, um, then brought about uh, um, the uh, creation of independent uh, Ukraine. Um, that I'm, I'm calling what I'm observing here is a revolution does not mean that um, this is yet done. This is an ongoing process. I don't think um, we, we are still, we, we already have a new Ukraine. The, the new Ukraine is, uh, is emerging and I expect for the next months and years uh, that it will be a history of scandals, of a uh, large turnover of elites, that it will be um, a zigzag um, a movement. Um, what I cannot imagine do is a demobilization of the civil society. I cannot imagine something happening like after the Orange Revolution of 2004, where sort of you have a, um, um, uh, this, the, these large demonstrations and people, people basically go home and um, and uh, nothing happens. Uh, a, a very interesting um, um, uh, aspect of this of this ongoing struggle uh, within Ukraine is, is going to be, uh, from my point of view, the development of Ukrainian semi-presidentialism. So what has happened after 2004 was maybe to a lesser extent that many people think a uh, result of the um, uh, personal um, um, uh, antipathies between uh, Timoshenko and Yushchenko, but it was structurally already um, uh, there, this, we know from, from the comparative literature, literature on semi-presidentialism that this is a, a principally problematic structure and uh, currently this has not been, been uh, uh, overcome. Uh, uh, Poroshenko even wants to, uh, wants to increase the powers of the presidency and um, that is going to be interesting to, um, to observe how this will then, then in the end play out because I don't think that there will be much patience now to, uh, to a bickering, to a, um, to a conflict between the prime minister and the president in, in this uh, new situation after um, the Euromaidans. Um, that I'm talking here about um, a, re a revolution does also not mean that um, um, if perhaps all patholo pathologies of the Ukrainian state disappear um, um, uh, and we have, a, we have positive developments like new state, state society relations, a larger role of the media, a larger role of civil society and so all does not mean that the new Ukraine that is currently um, um, appearing uh, is, will be a Ukraine without po pathologies. There might be new pathologies currently emerging. Uh, one of the scandals that is currently unfolding in Ukraine is the appointment of two neo-Nazis to, um, uh, to the Ukrainian, to high positions uh, within the Ukrainian administrative structure. So uh, um, a representative called Vadim Trojan, um, a representative of, the, of a neo-Nazi organization, the Patri Patriot Ukraine and the fighter for the Azov Battalion is, is, has been appointed uh, chief of the uh, Kiev police and um, uh, a neo-Nazi activist from the Svoboda party has been um, appointed um, to the SBU um, uh, in a high position. So there will be, um, uh, there is a revolution happening, but that does not mean that, that this, um, the new uh, Ukraine that we will be observing is necessarily uh, um, uh, some without uh, problems. It also does not mean that at the end of this, this would be the, the worst case scenario, there might not be a destruction of Ukraine. Uh, so um, I think the uh, Putin, the, 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 the uh, game that Putin is now playing on is actually destroying the uh, Ukrainian state by, uh, as I mentioned already, spoiling the investment and business climate, uh, uh, spoiling the tax collection in, in Ukraine, which would then, which could then uh, lead to, uh, um, to uh, also a, a catastrophic uh, um, um, uh, result that that the the state is not longer able to pay uh, to pay salaries, um, stipends, um, pensions, and then the the whole uh, Ukrainian state state uh, could uh, could collapse. Uh, uh, but still, I would I would I would. Um, I would speak of a revolution. If you if you look on the last uh, concrete events that that I think uh, are revolutionary, we had after the uh, Euromaidan the uh, victory of the Euromaidan in March, a, a radically new government. Um, uh, we have we have um, then uh, on the 25th of May uh, 2014. 
uh, radically new result in the um, in the uh, presidential elections with uh, um, with Poroshenko winning in almost all the electoral districts of uh, of Ukraine, at least with a, with a relative majority. We have in summer um, t uh, 2004 then the signing of the association agreement and then ratification of the association ag uh, agreement uh, on the same day um, as um, the uh, European Parliament um, uh, ratifies the uh, Europe, uh, the association agreement. And finally, we have the parliamentary elections that I mentioned already um, with a, a radically new um, a result, with a, with a new composition. Much has been written about this already. Um, uh, uh, Professor Kotkin men mentioned already that pro-European factions have a majority. Um, there, there is even a constitutional majority of, of, of sort of pro-European uh, deputies that uh, could then change uh, the um, uh, the, the constitution of, uh, of Ukraine. I, um, and just to illustrate the revolutionariness also of this, of this particular part of this, um, of this development of the last year, I want to maybe talk uh, three, uh, about three other results of the, um, of the uh, last parliamentary elections. That is the, um, the disappearance of the Communist Party from the, um, uh, from the, European, uh, from the U Ukrainian parliament. There has been, somebody has commented that's the first time for 96 years that the, um, uh, that the Communist Party is not represented in the, um, uh, in the Ukrainian parliament. What will be uh, uh, very interesting to observe in the next years is I think the performance of the opposition bloc, uh, whether the, um, the, uh, the successor organization of the party of regions will become a part of the, of the uh, new Ukrainian political spectrum or will, will disappear uh, as well as the um, Communist Party and then the, the entire party spectrum will consist of only these uh, more or less pro-European party. What we also have as a, as a uh, I would say, um, unexpectedly, um, unexpected result is the disappearance of the radical right as a, as a faction in the, um, in the Ukrainian parliament. The, the, um, uh, the interesting thing here about the performance of the Ukrainian radical right, that means of the Svoboda party and of the right sector, is that they did not, did not make it in the proportional part of the voting to the parliament because neither of them got over 5%. And they did not do so under conditions when um, a large part uh, of the East, uh, East Ukrainian uh, electorate and of course the whole of the Crimean electorate was not a able to p participate in the elections, uh, which means that had the whole of Ukraine voted in, in, the, um, in these elections, the performance of the radical right parties would have been even worse. They got in these elections, as they happened now, slightly over, over 6%, um, both together the right sector and, and Svoboda, had, had the whole of Ukraine voted, they might, might have gotten over less than 5%, and even, even if Svoboda and right sector had united before the before the um, elections, as, as my colleague Anton Shekhovtsov and myself have sort of indirectly recommended to the radical right, they, they would have, may not have gotten into the, um, into the um, uh, Ukrainian parliament. And finally, the third, I would say, novel, um, novel feature of this, uh, of this parliament in Ukraine today is the, um, is the advancement of a number of very prolific civil societies and investigative journalists to the parliament, which I think will change the uh, or which I hope will change the operation of the of, of the parliament. It's not just that the that the factions have changed, that the political directions of the factions has has changed, the ideologies have changed, but that actually I think also the the mode of operation of the of the uh, parliament I think will change with the civil society activists uh, who have gone through um, have come through to the parliament through through different. Um, different uh, uh, um, uh, uh, lists, but they, but they had an agreement already before the election that although they would, would go to parliament through different lists, they would actually um, then uh, coordinate their actions and uh, in, in the parliament and, and uh, one will hope that there will be indeed a sort of interfactional group of civil, uh, civic so civil society activists that will not just change the, the, um, the, uh, uh, the ideological part of the, of the, of the parliamentary work but also the, the, uh, the, the procedures in which uh, um, uh, decisions are taken. And to conclude maybe um, uh, on, this, on this short comment on the, on the current uh, domestic changes in, in Ukraine, I would uh, 
um, from, from what this means actually for the West is that the West will have to change its, uh, its attitude towards Ukraine. I think after, after, the, um, after people have died on the, on the Euromaidan, with the, with the war uh, in the East, um, with these uh, fundamental changes going on in many, in many parts of, of Ukrainian society, in politics and society, in cult culture and so on, the former European EU attitude towards uh, Ukraine, which could be labeled soft, soft conditionality, has to change. Um, this um, this approach, approach of setting conditions and then making the fulfillment of conditions uh, then um, a, a guideline for further support, support, something that has been also called more for more politics. So the more you do reform, the more we will support you, I think is not any longer uh, applicable to this new Ukraine that is currently uh, approaching. I think the, the EU sh should offer the membership perspective now. It should implement the visa liberalization plan now. The, um, the um, EU membership countries have to ratify um, the association agreement now and not wait until some reforms have been done because after these, um, these fundamental changes, I think uh, that, is, that is not any longer um, a policy um, to, um, to follow. For the US, that could, could mean, for instance, that the US should engage now and, for instance, perhaps um, support the creation of a, of a, um, of a political insurance she scheme for investment in, in Ukraine, um, a, a proposal that has been made uh, by George Soros, uh, which addresses, I think, what is, what is actually, from my point of view, I wonder how, how, um, how Anders and, and Taras uh, think about uh, this, maybe the, the core issue for Ukraine today, the, the spoiled investment and, and uh, uh, business climate, and um, uh, the, the West has to engage now and not wait for reform forms and, 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 and sort of postpone that um, uh, until, uh, until later. That's what I want. Great. Uh, thank you, Andres. Anders. Uh. Thank you very much. And I'm very happy to see that Georgetown is organizing this conference on uh, Ukraine uh, now because I think that's really a big uh, uh, topic. Uh, it's not only because I've been dealing with the Ukraine uh, for the la last 30 years, but uh, here we really have a country that can turn in different ways, and this will make a big difference, not only for Europe, but uh, also for the United, United States. Uh, to summarize the situation in one sentence, I would say that it's uh, uh, desperate, but not hopeless perhaps even hopeful. Uh, Ukraine today has three big economic problems. The first is the war. Uh, Ukraine's GDP this year is probably falling by 8%. Most of this is caused by the Russian uh, aggression against Ukraine. Uh, coal production in August and September was down by more than half. Steel production, by one third. It's rather difficult to uh, produce when uh, uh, Russian um, artillery has taken out the uh, <coughs> electricity uh, stations because then the coal mines are filled with water after the pumps have stopped uh, working and then uh, uh, you can't produce. The same with uh, uh, the, the uh, steel works. So, um, the war is the big problem. I'm not going to discuss it, but I'm happy to see so many people in uniform here because this is what's really needed in Ukraine. <laughs> the second uh, problem <laughs> is production, the corruption, and uh, that I will focus much more on. The third problem is public finances. If Ukraine does not change course, it will be uh, a default in the next two years. So therefore, it has to change, uh, uh, change course. To give you the big numbers, I already mentioned GDP this year seems to be falling by 8%. The budget deficit is probably 12% of GDP. The public debt is doubling from 40 uh, up towards 80% uh, of GDP. Much of this because of a devaluation, which is something like 80% now and because of a devaluation and the big budget deficit, inflation has risen to 20% now and is likely to continue. 
So if nothing is done, we'll see a, a devaluation inflation a, a cycle that will run the country down. So therefore, something has to be done. Ukraine now has a window of opportunity of four to five months when all the important things have to be done. And Ukraine cannot do this without uh, assistance. Uh, as Andreas mentioned, it has to be with substantial Western assistance. So what is needed? I could put it in six uh, broad points. Re uh, political reform, reform of a state, clean up uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, the state finances, clean up the energy sector, uh, and fourth, social reforms, six, international support. These are the six things that are needed for Ukraine to get right. And what does it mean? Political reform, here we are on a good way. The most important thing is that you throw the bums out. And for that, you need uh, elections. As President Parashenko has said repeatedly, uh, elections are the best form of illustration. Now we have seen uh, the election of uh, a competent president, and uh, in the parliamentary elections, the three most pro-Western, pro-reform parties won. This was a vote against populism for fiscal responsibility. Uh, the National Front, that surprisingly came out on top, had by far the best program in, uh, from an economic point, uh, point of view. Not right or left, but simply, is it competent or not? You have uh, people like uh, Yashko of a radical party who wanted to increase health care expenditure as a share of GDP uh, 10 times in the next eight years. Well, six years, sorry. You don't want such people, and we have got very few votes. So it was an anti-populist uh, vote. And uh, now we're waiting for a new government to be formed. Uh, it's clear that uh, Arseniy Yatsenyuk will stay as a, a prime minister, and there are a few very competent people. This is the best opportunity uh, we have seen so far politically. The second point is reform of the state. So what is needed? Again, through the bums out. Lustration. And Ukraine has already started with lustration, with a law adopted in September. Uh, when it was adopted, the Speaker of Parliament, uh, Alexander Turchinov, uh, shouted in the end, if you don't accept lustration, there will be castration. Mm -hmm. And I think that reflected the public mood that Andreas uh, uh, <coughs> uh, clarified uh, to you here. So, uh, if you have 10,000 judges and all are corrupt, what do you do? Do you start checking who of these 10,000 corrupt uh, judges is corrupt or not? Well, who would do it? Are the corrupt judges? That's not a way forward. Throw them all out. Get uh, somebody from outside coming and clean it up. And this is effectively what is being done now. Uh, Westerners don't like illustration. They say this is collective justice. We want individual justice. Sorry, individual justice requires a functioning legal system. And that's not in place. How do you build it? You have to do something more radical. And typically, which are the countries that have done illustration? Eastern Germany, Poland the Czech Republic, the three Baltic countries, all the most democratic uh, post-communist countries. So this is good for democracy. The next thing in the state that needs to be done is to abolish harmful agencies. Ukraine has 83 inspection agencies. I think that 11 would be a right number. You need a nuclear inspection, and you need a pharmaceutical inspection, but you don't need a trade inspection. You don't need an agricultural inspection. All these inspections that just go out and collect uh, uh, bribes. And deregulate, give freedom. If you enter a Ukrainian restaurant, you find on each page 
of the menu, three signatures of the three managers of the restaurant, and a stamp on each page. Who demands this? We end the monopoly committee. What business does it have to do these things? It functions as a price control commission. There's so much that needs to be cleaned up. And uh, after having cleaned up the state, you need to have the public finances. I won't uh, delve on that, uh, but public expenditure is now 53% of GDP this year. It should be 35% of GDP. In the next few years, this has to come down and simplify the tax system at the same time. Uh, the big problem has all along in Ukraine been gas trade. All the fortunes in the 1990s were made on gas trade with Russia. Gas trade is Russia's best weapon to keep Ukraine corrupt. Now, in recent years, the corruption has been mainly inside the country. So how do you make money on gas in Ukraine? You buy it at a state-controlled price for $30 per 1,000 cubic meters, and you sell it for $380 per 1,000 cubic meters, 12 times more. A few people make $3 billion on this each year in Ukraine. This has to stop. And how do you do it? Simple. You unify the energy prices. Get just uh, bring them up to a market level. If you don't have a market, you need regulation of them, but it should be in line with the market. So what does the IMF do, for example? In the last nine agreements with Ukraine, they've always demanded that the prices should be increased gradually during several years. What happens? The government does the first price increase and not the next because then they're out of crisis and the IMF program is broken. This is no way forward. It has to be done in a radical, straightforward fashion and then give social compensation to people. And of course, the social sector in Ukraine gets large amounts of money, which is being spent on useless staff and uh, unnecessary real estate. Give it on services, give proper salaries. As they say in Ukraine, if you pay peanuts, you get monkeys and you want to have a proper staff in the public sector. So what should the West do about this? Uh, uh, substantial international support is needed. You, uh, Ukraine got an IMF agreement uh, for two years in um, March this year with $17 billion of financing. Uh, this, uh, Ukraine can't fulfill the conditions because of a war and uh, it has to be redone. The EU has the association agreement with Ukraine, which is a reform plan. It's a big document with the appendixes, uh, 2,500 pages at least. So it's a, <clears throat> it's a very big document. And uh, the EU is offering technical assistance uh, of uh, an adequate kind to do this. But the EU also needs to provide money. If you're suffering from war damages, then we are in a Marshall Plan situation. You don't give uh, loans for war damages. This is humanitarian uh, assistance. And humanitarian assistance is given as uh, grants. And my argument is that the European Union should provide billions of dollars now in grants to Ukraine. And uh, when should this be done? As soon as the new government has come into place, which will be probably mid-December. All these things have to be done. It has to be led by the U Ukrainian government, but they will need financing. So in January, February next year, I think that the West needs to come together with the Ukrainian government and uh, make up a totally new financing uh, plan uh, for Ukraine. It can be done, it must be done, otherwise we have a big mess. Thank you. I missed the hopeful part of that, Andres, but, uh, <laughs> but thank you very much for a very sobering uh, assessment it of what's going on. Yeah, yeah, no. okay. um, all right, our next speaker is uh, Taras Kuzio, and he's going to talk about the military situation. Military security, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, this is not Alexei Aran. I was 
I was found wandering the streets of Georgetown and, and brought in because Alexei Horan couldn't come. But anyway, I'm, I, I'm, so I came in at the end of the first um, very interesting presentation, and I'd like to say that my talk could be, could be actually called How Nationalism and National Minorities Have Saved, U Saved Ukraine, or have Defended and Protected Ukraine. And I mean nationalism here in the theoretical sense of a very broad understanding from civic, territorial, to ethno, ethno linguistic and cultural. Um, so what Americans would call patriots as well as nationalists. Um, and here I think a crucial thing is differences between Ukrainian and Russian nationalism, which came up in the first talk as I walked in, sadly, at the end. Um, and that is the differences in Russian nationalism, um, well, well, firstly, only a handful of dissidents in the Soviet Union called for the independence of Russia from the Soviet Union. You can count them on one hand, Amalric, Bukovsky, and a few others, um, which was not the case in the Baltic states, Ukraine, Georgia, Armenia, elsewhere. Secondly, Russian and Soviet identity was intertwined. There were no Russian institutions in Moscow. In Ukraine and the other non-Russian republics, there was a dual loyalty to the republic and to Moscow, to the Soviet Union. In, in Moscow, there was one intertwined loyalty, which made Russian identity even different to Serbian, because Serbia had institutions in Yugoslavia separate to Yugoslavian institutions in Belgrade. It was only Boris Yeltsin in 1990 that began building Russian separate institutions. Thirdly, Russia never declared independence in 1991. Um, so today it celebrates its declaration of sovereignty in 1990 as its declaration of independence. That makes it very different to Ukraine. Why? Um, well, because Ukraine and every country has mythology, and this obviously comes out in the Declaration of Independence of August 1991. It calls the Declaration as a renewal of a thousand year history of Ukrainian statehood. So it goes, uses the Ukrainian national narrative, Mikhail Khrushchevsky, going back to Kiev Rus as the first Ukrainian state. I say, whether we see this as mythology or not is, a different, is not, a, not the question here. Secondly, that Ukrainian national narrative, and I call it national narrative, not nationalistic narrative, um, because Khrushchevsky was a social democrat um, in the first Ukrainian government in 1917, um, was developed in all the Ukrainian school textbooks in the last 25 years. I mean, this was, this first, in the first part of the 1990s, the big influence was from the Ukrainian diaspora. Oris Subtelny's history of Ukraine was very influential. Um, but then Ukrainians began reproducing their own based on this band in the Soviet Union national narrative since the 1930s. And that was, um, so many generations of school children um, have, been, have gone through this schooling with this national narrative. Um, and, and this has also, of course, influenced the media and just generally political discourse. So that, that gives the background to why I would say Vladimir Putin's project has failed, and I'll explain why. Um, the Ukrainian military was in no fit state to defend Ukraine in the spring of this year. If Putin had done not a hybrid war, but a full-scale invasion, Ukraine would have been defeated. It was the volunteer battalions, composed of both civic, territorial nationalist patriots, as well as ethnic nationalists, who rushed to, de to, to defend Ukraine, and they, in fact, um, were the ones who really bore the brunt of the fighting. Of course, also national minorities played an important role. The Jewish Ukraine oligarch Igor Kolomoisky prevented any outbreaks of separatism in Dnipropetrovsk. The Jewish community in Ukraine in general, uh, which Putin tried to use against the Euromaidan authorities, were very loyal to and have and remain loyal to Ukraine. Um, the Minister of Interior and these volunteer battalions became part of a new national guard under the Ministry of Interior primarily. Um, the Minister of Interior is an Armenian from Kharkiv. Um, and I'll explain why Kharkiv was crucial here. So we have the, the growth of about, I think, I don't know, maybe Andreas knows more, about 50 or more volunteer battalions, with only one or two not under the control of the Ministry of Interior. The, the private sector, I think, are separate on their own. We even have two Chechen battalions, as I just found out in a few days ago, fighting against the Russian side. Um, some of these, yes, um, particularly the Azov Battalion based in Mariupol, linked to the Social National Party, does have Nazi-like um, insignia. Um, but I wouldn't say that for the majority of them. If you go onto YouTube and look at these videos of these battalions, you'll see that 
Probably two-thirds of the people in them speak Russian, not Ukrainian. The biggest danger, though, about these battalions is going back to the economic side and why everything is interconnected in Ukraine in, th in the three, three talks, is that most of these volunteers had to buy their own military equipment. So on average, about $2,500 each, which, if you translate that in the American-Canadian sense, we're talking $15,000 per person. I, I, I pose this question in Canada, how many Canadians would pay $15,000 of their own money to become a volunteer um, fighter. Um, it's as though if America was being invaded that the militias in America would brunt, bear the brunt of the fighting because the American military is not really up to scratch. Because it's being demoralized because of lack of funding in the case of Ukraine. So some, what James Scher is an expert on this, in this question. Um, and of course under Yanukovych was deliberately dismantled and destroyed, maybe at the behest of Vladimir Putin. So we have a high volume of private weaponry. And what I don't understand is what's going to happen if this conflict ever ends. Um, because if, I've, if I'm a volunteer in Ukraine and I've bought, spent two and a half thousand dollars of my own money for all this equipment, well surely this equipment belongs to me, not to the Ministry of Interior. Um, why should I give it back? And we're not just talking about individual equipment. Some, some units have volunteers which are very active, as Andreas has said, civil society is extremely active, including in East Ukraine, uh, providing all, all forms of assistance that the state is unable to provide, me medical, food, military equipment. We're talking about even uh, civil society organizations collecting $20,000 to buy an APC for some of these units. So who does that APC belong to? Um, now, of course, some of these battalion volunteer battalion leaders have been elected to parliament, including in, po in, the, na in the Popular Front, Yatsenyuk's Popular Front. Um, so they're going to be, I think, probably very active in the Ukrainian parliament, and they're going to be very angry if things are not done. Because they've seen their comrades die on the battlefront. So they want change, just like Ukrainian society wants change. So the Ukrainian authorities, I agree with here with Anders, the Ukrainian authorities are under tremendous pressure, both domestically from civil society and, and these military volunteer battalions, as well as from the West, where I think there is still a lot of skepticism about Ukrainian commitment to reform and fighting corruption. Why do I think Putin's objectives have failed? Well, his, he lives in his own mythological bubble regarding Ukraine. He assumed that the whole eight, speak, eight Russian-speaking regions of eastern and southern Ukraine would rise up and support uh, the Ruski Mir, uh, union with Russia, support Russia. That didn't happen. In fact, um, it only really happened in two of the eight regions, in the Donbass, Donetsk, Luhansk. Um, and even there, um, he failed even in comparison to the other frozen conflicts, where the whole of Transnistria, the whole of South Ossetia, Abkhazia, Nagorno-Karabakh, were taken over by Russian proxy forces. In the case of Ukraine, only 30% of Donbass is controlled um, by Russia, and even there they can't take control of the Donetsk airport where the Ukrainians say Ukrainian cyborgs are fighting the Russian forces. Um, what this conflict did, and I've traveled a lot in the last sort of year around eastern southern Ukraine, in October I was just in Kharkiv and Odessa, what this did was forced until this spring a very a uh, dual identity you found very common in eastern southern Ukraine of a Russian Ukrainian identity, which in some parts of eastern southern Ukraine was up to 40, 50 percent of the population. Um, put of, and sometimes in Donbass, that would um, interfuse with the Soviet identity. What they did, it forced people to choose which side they were on. In Donbass, they chose primarily, in many cases, uh, the pro Russian side, which is not surprising. Um, but in the other regions, Putin was surprised to find that the pro-Ukrainian side came out on top. Um, now, and, the, and one reason for that is that opinion polls have always showed that Donbass is very similar to Crimea um, in terms of its identity, in terms of its Soviet identity, and it's the only region of eastern southern Ukraine where you had um, a large constituency of about 30% similar to the Crimea, in support of separatism, support of, of sep breaking away from Ukraine. In the rest of eastern southern Ukraine, it was under 10%, and in some places under 5%. So 
So I would, I would divide the eastern and southern Ukraine into three regions. This is from my research. The pro-Russian, pro-Soviet, if you want to even call it that, was the Donbass, uh, the heartland of the party of regions. Uh, swing regions, Kharkiv, Odessa, which could have gone either way in the spring, and then the pro-Ukrainian, Dnipropetrovsk, Zaporizhia, Kherson, Mikolaev. Now, I will conclude by saying, where do we go from here? Well, Putin has to either accept the way we are as, as it is, and that his hybrid war has only got him what he's got, which is 30% of Donbass, but not a new Russia, and no land bridge to Crimea, or he has to go to a full-scale war where he can no longer deny that his forces, even how ludicrous it is, he deny his forces are in Ukraine. The problem with going to a full-scale war away from hybrid war is that, as of today, there was an opinion poll in Ukrainska Pravda, a Russian poll from Levada Center, 70% of Russians are opposed to, their, to, them, to themselves fighting in Ukraine, to their sons or brothers fighting in eastern Ukraine. So there's a lot of the support for providing aid to the rebels in eastern Ukraine, but not support for Russian troops fighting in eastern Ukraine. I don't think that the Russian army are all green men, 10% maximum. The rest of the 90% are probably as bad as the Ukrainian army. So you can see what, how, how that would be a pretty disastrous invasion. Ukrainians are a massive country, geographically in size. And if you invaded and occupied, how would you hold it? You would need half a million troops plus. It's just simply impossible. Um, you might be welcomed in the Crimea and Donbass, but not in the rest of East and Southern Ukraine. Um, so, and also, of course, what is holding him back is the whole question of, of if he moves from hybrid to full-scale invasion, that would, the, the level of sanctions will be crippling on Russia. I mean, we will be going to Iranian-style sanctions. So I think um, Putin has limited objectives at the moment. Um, and he, ha he might try to do something before winter, but if not, the next time will be the spring. Thank you. Thank you, Taras. Uh, let's open it up to some questions from the audience. Uh, Jim Sher. Um, we're already acquainted. Uh, I have two. Has someone been shot? No. <laughs> it's not me. I have, I have two. Uh, two related questions for Andreas, uh, and I'm sure Taras uh, will also want to comment on them. In, in a state whose president, prime minister, and minister of interior are at least in large part people of Jewish antecedents, this whole issue of neo-Nazis in the government is very problematic, and I'd like you to explain what you mean when you say to neo-Nazis have recently been appointed. In what way are these individuals programmatically Nazi? Do they have an ethnically purist agenda? Do they believe in restricting Jewish influence in Ukrainian life? What does it mean uh, exactly? And related to that, I'd be interested in your evaluation of the, of, of the character of Pravi sector. Is it a single entity or a collection of different temperaments and groups. The reason I ask it is, as, as you doubtless know, going back to the time of the Tsarist Akhrana, there has been a Russian tradition of creating, penetrating, and financing uh, extreme groups and using them as instruments of provocation and others. And there are persistent rumors, not only from Ukrainian, but from Russian sources, well-embedded Russian sources, about a financial relationship to Pravi sector, as, of course, there was in more documented way with, the, with Una Unso uh, in the past. So I'd be uh, grateful for your um, response to those. Thank you. Should I go ahead? Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I, I've studied uh, 
Russian ultranationalism and fascism, I would call it intensively, and also co comparative literature on, on, on fascism. So I'm, I'm careful in, in using these words. Unfortunately, with Vadim Trojan and Yuri Mikhail Shishin, who have been appointed to the, um, by the Ministry of Imperial and the SBU, they are actually neo-Nazis. Uh, uh, that's not an, 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 an exaggeration. I don't think they have been appointed because they are neo-Nazis, but because rather uh, they, it's not known that they have actually this this uh, background. So Trojan comes from this Patriot Ukraine, Socialna Nacionalna Assemblea, um, which has a, a biologically racist uh, ideology. Uh, they speak about the Aryan race and how the Ukrainian um, white race should should uh, you know I'm, I'm, this is this is actually neo Nazism and um, and it's um, I've, I've you know I'm posting now almost every day um, um, in, uh, a, a comment on this on on Facebook and asking Arsen Avakov how, how could he and I think it's a mistake it's, they don't know this um, so Trojan has been uh, in the Azov Battalion he has. As other as other of the um, Bilecki and and so and so on who has been um, elected to parliament now, um, they've shown themselves to be good patri patriots in in the in the war against um, the uh, covered Russian intervention. Um, uh, with Yuri Mikhalchishin, I'm I'm a bit more surprised because. Uh, um, I don't know of any particular. Uh, he has been, as far as I know, on also on the front, and uh, but but I don't uh, I, I don't have yet read, read any reports of him being a sort of a hero of the war, um, and he is a is a is a very well known uh, Ukrainian neo Nazi. He is the most extreme um, member of the um, old Svoboda faction of the of the parliament. Uh, he has written a, a doctoral dissertation. At Lviv, about uh, comparing the Italian and and, uh, not, and, and German Nazi movements, um, he has made statements about the Holocaust and so on. And um, I'm just surprised that some somebody as prolific as him, uh, a Nazi, uh, was in, um, um, uh, now uh, has been appointed a head of a department. I also think that's a, that's a mistake. I don't think that's he has you know. I, I think the the, the the background for this is also that. Um, there is all this suspicion about uh, Russian agents sort of uh, infiltrating these these ministries, and and then then they find these these persons who have these these uh, radical patriotic views, and then they appoint them, and assuming that this would not would not be a Russian agent, um, and uh, maybe that's the the point, uh, the reason for these appointments. About private sector, it's uh, first of all it's a collection of groups that uh, that come from different uh, uh, backgrounds. So there is. The um, uh, the uh, this group called the um, uh, I can't remember the uh, uh, Imini uh, um, uh, the Trident uh, Trident Trident of of, of Stepan Bandera uh, from which um, uh, Mitro Yaros comes, which I would call um, not fascist but rather sort of ultra nationalist Christian sort of. Uh, group. Then there, there was a, a, a very small group called White Hammer, which used to be for a, for a while a me member of the private sector. So, so it's a it's an umbrella organization of various ultra nationalist groups. Some of them fascist and neo Nazi. But moreover, it seems to be a collection of different regional brands. Of of um, and there's very little re research about that. That's a that's a major program uh, problem uh, of um, uh, regional uh, groups that call themselves private sector that use the symbol of private sector, but that uh, may have no, uh, no uh, um, close relationship to the uh, to the central organs of of private sector. Um, I, uh, yeah, one could uh, speculate a lot about how much the uh, uh, Russian secret service has infiltrated. That the most uh, obvious example of a, a very strange Russian connection is a man called Mitro Korshinsky who has been involved in the um, um, in the provocation on 1st of September 2013 in front of the presidential administration who is now also linked to the Azov battalion and who was in the past a, a, a member of the highest council of the international Eurasian movement of Alexander Dugin and gave a, and has made a presentation at the Seliger uh, youth camp of the Nashi movement uh, sort of 
anti-Orange, anti-Ukrainian um, uh, movement, youth movement uh, of, of, of the Kremlin, and he has been in, in, in connected also to the Azov Battalion, to the Social National Assembly. But these are secret operations, and we, we sort of, we don't know. We can only sp speculate, I guess, um, uh, Taras can also say something on this. Well, one of the interesting, well, there's, a, there's a number of different factors. I can only speculate why this Azov person was made commander of Kiev uh, Oblast Police. It's probably because they are very loyal um, to the current Armenian Ukrainian Minister of Interior, Mr. Avakov, and Kiev would be a crucial place both for in, in the event of some kind of Russian invasion or, um, I mean, it would be a crucial sort of place to maintain control of. That would be my suspicion. I know that the Azov, Azov battalion, and maybe it's now bigger than a battalion, is certainly one of the prize National Guard formations under the current Ministry of Interior. But, uh, but I'd like to broaden this to um, uh, the, 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 there's two other factors here. Um, the, 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 the weirdest part of, of this whole question is that you have Russian fascists coming to Ukraine to fight Ukrainian fascists. Um, and, um, you know, you have Russians creating an anti-fascist committee in the Crimea um, who themselves are fascists to fight Ukrainian alleged fascists. Um, and, of course, the, the, Premier, the Prime Minister, the new, newly elected leader of the Crimea, is himself a fascist and member of the Russian National Unity Party. Um, so you have that aspect. And I think a lot of this comes not just uh, the previous discussion about World War II. It's not just World War II. Um, Soviet propaganda ideological tirades went all the way through to the late 1980s um, directed against so-called bourgeois nationalists. And the bourgeois nationalist could be anybody from a national communist such as Ivan Juba to a far-right nationalist. It was basically anybody who was critical of, of the Soviet Union. It wasn't just Lukinenko who quoted Lenin, it was Ivan Juba. So you had, you had this, and from a viewpoint of Putin and his is circles and Russian public opinion, which backs that. Anybody who is a Ukrainian patriot who's pro-European is a fascist, de facto, based from this past ideological experience. Um, the primary attacks in the Soviet Union against so-called bourgeois nationalists were in the Baltic states of Ukraine. There was nothing equivalent against Russian nationalism in the diaspora. And secondly, you've got the European far right is even more weirdly pro-Putin and anti-Ukrainian. Um, they, in the European Parliament, it was the biggest group that voted against ratification of the European Union Association Agreement was Le Pen's party from France. So the European far right has a similar agenda to Putin, which is anti-EU, and if Ukraine's moving to Europe, it's anti-Ukrainian. So it's a very, and on the Russian separatist side, you have hundreds of far right sort of crazies from Serbia, France, and elsewhere fighting they think they're fighting against the West, which is the Ukrainian forces. So it, it's, it's a kind of a broader, complex problem. Thank you, Andrea Ilarino. <clears throat> uh, I have three questions, three whys, uh, each to each of the members of the panel. Um, Andreas, uh, just as sort of uh, for all these eight, nine months, the Kremlin propaganda was portraying Ukraine as already has been mentioned, Nazis, fascists, uh, and all these banderas and so on. But in the parliamentary election, neither Svoboda nor right sector uh, just were not able to uh, enter the parliament. How would you explain it? So those who were considered to be um, most important participants of Maidan revolution, or even heroes of revolution of this patriotic war against the invasion, uh, failed to enter the parliament. So definitely it's completely destroyed the Kremlin's argument, but we need to understand what is going on in the Ukrainian society. How would they understand it? Uh, Anders, um, just you're already some kind of for a long time as I'm kind of looking at the situation from inside. How would you explain that for all these eight months, almost nothing has been done in the area of economic reform? There is some uh, little steps, but essentially not much, neither in budget reform nor in deregulation. And as we know, the corruption cases are still uh, pretty, pretty very serious, even in your administration. And Taras, uh, another why. 
uh, the military command and the military leadership has demonstrated uh, spectacular failures. In many cases, like Izvarina or Ilovaisk and many others. Um, first of all, how it is possible to explain uh, the kind of this uh, uh, failures on the military side, and more uh, more important, why political leadership did not touch, did not solve these issues uh, promptly, and in some cases even at all. And as you know, many calls in the Ukrainian civil society. Uh, uh, asking question about the some kind of uh, complicity uh, of uh, some leadership, even with the uh, aggressor. So how would you explain all this situation? Thank you very much, the hard questions. So <laughs> take them in the order in which they were received. Um, Yes, about the um, Spoboda and uh, uh, right sector. So they, there are, uh, my colleagues um, and me, we have counted that there are now 13 deputies in the, um, uh, in the new RADA that can, could be classified as ultranationalists, 13 uh, of the 423 something deputies, something, uh, I, I can't remember the uh, 423. Um, um, and the reason for this is that neither uh, Spoboda nor the right sector got over uh, 5%. And as I mentioned already, I think Keith has also mentioned that in his interview for the Daniliv seminar, the, the, um, the real surprising thing here is that Spoboda did not manage to pass the 5% um, um, barrier in spite of the Donbass taking uh, part only to a, to a small extent in the elections and Crimea not taking part in the elections. So the, the fall of the, uh, the decline of the uh, radical right has been even sharper than it, 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 it's ex expressed by, uh, by the numbers which when Svoboda got in 2012, 10.44% and now I think the right sector and Svoboda got together uh, somewhat over, over 6%. So the, the fall is even, even larger than expressed in the, in, the, in, the, in the numbers and it has to do with the very simple fact that the, um, uh, the 2012 results for Svoboda were unusual. And, um, and there is really an anomaly here, actually the exact anomaly of what, what the Russian propaganda is, is trying to portray. The big anomaly of, of post-Soviet Ukraine is the weakness of the radical right. It's not the strength of the radical right, but the weakness of the radical right. And there was one exception, the 2012 parliamentary elections, but there we have a very untypical electorate for Svoboda. So many of the, of the voters of, the, of Svoboda and uh, these, the, the um, the exit polls have shown then where, where they did not just ask people where, whom they voted for, but also what their background is, what their education is. So, so we have a very, in, in 2012, we have a very urban, very highly educated and very pro-European, pro-democratic electorate for Svoboda, one of the most pro-European and, and, and highly educated electorates of all the parties of the 2012 um, uh, elections, which has to do with the fact that many people sim who voted in 2012 for Svoboda were, were voting not for a radical right party, but, but for the most disciplined, militant, anti yanukovych party. That was, I think, the, the, um, uh, the reason the, was the decline, basically, of the National Democrats who had discredited themselves by, with the Tushki, with the, with the turncoats who have who, who run over to, to, to the Yanukovych government, uh, uh, to the Azarov government once Yanukovych became president. And the people, many people who have voted in 2012 for, for the Svoboda party uh, rightly so assumed that Svoboda deputies would not run over to, to, to Yanukovych and never did a, a Svoboda deputy go to. to uh, so, the, so actually the 2012 is the big uh, exception and now Ukraine has simply returned to its old sort of pattern of, uh, uh, of support for radical rightists, which is low which is lower than in much, uh, uh, in much of, of, uh, of Europe, of both Eastern and Western Europe, where the, where the support is, is, is much higher. That, that is, a, that is a, a paradox in a way. I cannot fully explain that. Uh, I mean, there are the obvious explanations. You have a divided nation and you have sort of different nationalisms there, but the Vlaams Belang, um, the, the Flemish ultranationalist party, is a big force in Belgium. Also, Belgium is a divided country. Uh, even more divided so than so than Ukraine, but a, a right radical party there has a has a has a big role to to, to play. And with the with the Euromaidan, I think what what has, has happened here is simply that um, the of course the ultra nationalist 
activists were highly mobilized during the uh, uh, during the Euromaidan. There were lots lots of Svoboda flags, lots of uh, right sector flags, lots of um, UN flags, the the red um, uh, red black flags. But this wasn't representative of the Euro Euromaidan as a whole. Um, that was just that they were so present on the ever in the everyday life of the Euromaidan. It was not something that actually drove the uh, Euromaidan, which was which was uh, European integration, anti-corruption, uh, which are also topics that that the uh, that at least Svoboda has uh, supported, but which were not uh, characteristic for the radical right. Anders, yes. Yeah, yeah, good question, Andre. I'll give you uh, two qu uh, answers and then elaborate on bo uh, both of them. One is that the reforms have actually been quite substantial. The other is that uh, since the 1st of uh, uh, July, the government has not enjoyed a majority in parliament uh, with regard to economic issues. With regard to national security issues, yes. Because the swing vote, the defectors from... Uh, uh, the regions that uh, formed the government ma uh, majority, uh, about 40 uh, deputies each from Akhmetov and from the Firtash Lobochkin uh, 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 factions, they would not vote against corruption because corruption is their business. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you can't have much of anti corruption legislation if you do not push it through. But what has been accomplished um, after all, it is all the IMF agreement uh, conditions, which were quite substantial in, uh, in uh, uh, March and uh, April, for example, a law on state procurement, increasing gas prices by 56%, uh, let the exchange rate uh, the uh, float and uh, certain sorting out of a, a banking system. More recently, we have seen a substantial uh, package on anti-corruption law. And what I particularly like there, it is um, uh, open public registries of uh, property that uh, you now have to declare any company in Ukraine in the registry, otherwise it cannot be registered as a company in Ukraine. Today, virtually all big companies in Ukraine are anonymously owned by trust in offshore havens. So uh, this is a big difference. And also this will apply for real estate, both um, urban and uh, agricultural real estate as far, uh, as far as I uh, understand, and it will all be uh, available in electronic form and um, public, of course, if it's properly uh, imp implemented. Uh, but you, you also have other uh, problems uh, behind here, and that is useless ministers. Many ministers were appointed, as they say in uh, Kiev, because they stood on Maidan and uh, not because they had uh, any particular intentions uh, without naming names. There are uh, quite a few people who are there for themselves and uh, not uh, because they want to do something. In this kind of situation, you get a lot of accidental people coming to the fore. And you also have this very harmful uh, uh, party uh, quotas. So the worst quota here, undoubtedly, was the Svoboda quota. So it appears that the Svoboda people knew that they would be in government for a very short period, so they had to make money very fast. Um, two of the most uh, uh, obnoxious Svoboda appointments was first the Minister of Defense for three weeks, who did not make any decision during the uh, Russian annexation of Crimea which is outrageous, but uh, of course people didn't want to publicize that too much uh, at the time. And as you undoubtedly have noticed, none of uh, Yanukovych people has actually been prosecuted because uh, the prosecutor general, Magnitsky from Svoboda, seems to have had a very successful business going. And uh, uh, to close a case that's very valuable for your private finances. And uh, there are problems like that. 
But uh, the good thing, as we've all talked about, is that people are seeing this now. So it will be more uh, difficult. So therefore, the pressure on the uh, new government to do something will be all greater. And personally, I think it's uh, a great combination that we are seeing coming to the fore now, that where Jatsenyuk probably has the most competent people. Uh, Parashenko has uh, the largest number of uh, deputies. And uh, we have self-help with 11%, uh, which is there to keep the others honest, uh, which consists essentially of civil activists who have not been before. Generally, we have seen in uh, uh, Central uh, and Eastern uh, European countries that the best governments are those that are coalition governments, because then they have to keep one another honest or can do so. And uh, that don't last for long. The three, uh, in the first decade of transition, uh, the Baltic uh, governments and the Polish government lasted on average one year. I think that this is how we should see it. I think that we should see this as an iterative uh, process. And your statement here, I think, uh, fits uh, just into it. Thank you. Um, the, it's not just military that were um, problematical. Um, Ukraine's security forces in general, including the prosecutor's office, are bloated, incompetent, corrupt, and infiltrated. That's a four, I would say. Bloated, what do I mean? Well, the British United Kingdom has 20 million more people than Ukraine. It has around 120,000 police and prison officers. Ukraine has 300,000. And they are useless and trusted by less than 3% of the population, 4% of the population. Um, incompetent, of Ukraine has more generals than the U.S. Army. Um, the, uh, and these were not individuals who were trained to fight hybrid and these kind of wars. They were trained to fight NATO in the old days. Um, corrupt is obvious what I'm talking about. Um, just the, and that has continued to some degree with middlemen selling weaponry from military industrial plants to civil society volunteers who then buy them for the National Guard volunteer battalions. That corruption has continued, but maybe with some people going to jail. Infiltrated, um, that especially increased under Yanukovych. I was one of the few to write about it in Eurasia Daily Monitor, but nobody wanted to hear about it here, including amongst my academic colleagues. Um, it was like, a, you know, you're, you're being too anti-Yanukovych. It can't be that bad. Um, Sergei Leshenko, one of the best journalists in Ukraine, he was at the NAD for a fellowship a few years ago. Um, he has a new book out on, on Yanukovych, fantastic book, certainly worth translating into English on the Yanukovych era. And he says that uh, Yanukovych was uh, uh, hired or taken control of by the KGB after his second time in prison in the early 70s. He became a KGB informer. Um, his, his purpose was to inform and organize crime groups in Donbass, in Donetsk. Um, and he therefore says that during the time he was in, in, in Ukraine, in, in, in power, particularly during the time of this crisis, um, he was, um, um, there was a lot of compromise that, that, uh, that Putin had on Yanukovych. Former Polish foreign minister um, Sikorsky says the same, that he felt he was one of the people one of the two, two EU representatives negotiating roundtable compromise on the 21st of February. Uh, he also says that Putin had a lot of compromise. So that infiltration was there. To what degree, um, I think it's a mixture of the lack of financing given to the Ukrainian military, plus the even more willingness to permit Russian infiltration of both the security service um, and in particular the military under Yanukovych. So it's a mixture of those, those things. Now, um, we know that Yanukovych was supposed to, according to Leshenko, invite in Russian forces to prop up his regime, but he, he got scared and he fled Ukraine. He called for Russia to intervene from Russia, not when he was in Ukraine in early March. Um, so that infiltration was there, yes, and we're still, I think, collecting evidence of it, but certainly accelerated under, under Yanukovych. But the person, the expert here in this room is Mr. James Sher on this question, who's been following this for 20 years. And he's not a Russian agent. <laughs> so far as we know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, I think it's best, given the time we have left, to collect some questions. So Harley Balzer.
Thank you. Uh, I'm Harley Balzer, Department of Government and School of Foreign Service here at Georgetown. Uh, Taras, uh, I'd underline what you said about the public opinion. Uh, I haven't been able to find a single region in Ukraine where a majority ever voted for violation of their territorial integrity. Uh, and in Russia, if you look at Putin's re-election prospects as opposed to his approval rating, uh, that's now under 50%. Uh, doesn't mean that people who count the votes wouldn't alter it, but uh, you know, that is where the numbers are. Uh, but my real question for both uh, Andreas and, and Taras is about civil society. I was a little surprised to hear you say that you would expect continued mobilization. You know, everything we know about transitions and civil society says you tend to get rapid mobilization, rapid demobilization. Uh, you've both been looking at this a lot more closely than I have. Uh, is there some reason to believe that Ukraine is going to be different? You know, once the economic reforms start to bite, Decisions have to be made between social spending and military spending. Uh, isn't some of the bloom going to wear off? And Thane Gustafson. Thank you, Thane Gustafson, Professor of Government, Georgetown. Uh, my question is for our chairman. Uh, in Ottawa last week, uh, you made a terrific presentation uh, which, in which I heard you to say that we should take less comfort from the parliamentary election results than most of the media and most of the commentators have done. Because what is significant is not the gain in the numerator, as you put it, for the good guys, but rather the, in the um, decline in the denominator, uh, by which you meant that the turnout, particularly in the East and South, has been less and less and less and less. And in fact, this, this goes back a decade, a decade and a half. The bottom line which you drew, correct me if I heard you wrong, was that the East and the South are gradually being disenfranchised or even, to put it more specifically, are disenfranchising themselves. And this, in fact, is a very worrisome trend and will lead to trouble not only today, but in the future. Could you comment on that? Because I don't think that point has been brought out in the present discussion. And yes, the gentleman here in the center. Uh, Patrick Bell, uh, Florida International University. Um, in my research, I cover the effect of social movement, uh, effect of social media on protest movements. And what I've seen, in particular, in my field research in Ukraine this summer, was the the, the use of. Um, various social media platforms by civil society groups. In particular, in regards to Euromaidan, there was a uh, group called Divana Sotnia, which is uh, the SOFA army, basically, and they organized a lot of different medical, basically, um, you might say supply runs, and there was an entire hospital, essentially, right next to the, uh, right next to the, um, uh, to the protest grounds, if you will, but you know this. My question for, for each one of the panelists is, how do you think um, this social revolution, as you made it, uh, man, uh, mentioned, Andreas, has been affected by the use, for example, of the increased importance of social media, and in particular, of these, the use by, social, uh, by civil society groups? Um, I'm thinking in particular of two uh, examples, um, the use of uh, the growth and importance of Hromskada TV, um, from uh, an internet-only station to now what might be called a public television station, and also uh, the use, I would say, in this last parliamentary election. And in particular, the issue is this. There has been a war of perception, as I see it, uh, in particular waged on social media regarding what Euromaidan meant, regarding what the Ukrainian-Russian cri Ukrainian crisis means now. and you can see a definite difference between um, Russian media coverage and basically, I would say, all other coverage in terms of what they're getting out of it and what this Ukrainian crisis means. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, let's turn back to the panelists uh, and to myself, because Thane brought me in. But uh, let's go uh, just down the line as briefly as possible, because we only have five minutes left. Um, about the skepticism, the, um, uh, the possible demobilization of civil um, society. I mean, that's a speculation, but 
just my, that's an impressionistic account, is that among the civil society activists in Kiev, there's a lot of skepticism now. So it's, it's not enthusiasm, actually. It's sort of, they are very critical, uh, very skeptical, and so on. That makes me hopeful, actually. They, you know, they, they know what happened after 2004. They mobilized for a few weeks. Yushchenko then became president, and they withdrew, and then it all went, went wrong. That, so that's my, my first hope, that they, they will continue these, these mobilization. And then the other thing is that simply many of them are, or not many, a, a few important of them are now in parliament. Zalishuk, Hopko, Sobolev, Leshenko, Nayem, um, uh, and uh, others, they are in parliament and they will be active there, so I, I think there, there will be continued um, uh, impact there. About the, um, uh, the um, uh, social media, um, uh, well, I, th I think that's a very complicated issue that hasn't been uh, fully uh, researched, I, I, th I think, so far. Um, uh, I would just mention that um, social media is, of course, also heavily used by, uh, by the Russian state, by so-called trolls and so on, so there is a um, uh, so it's a very ambivalent uh, phenomenon. Um, um, the, 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 the positive thing about social media in this particular revolution has been maybe that it has not, um, has not prevented actual action. So people were not just sitting in Facebook and Twitter, but they also came out on the streets and they used tw tw Twitter and Facebook to organize, but, but it was not a, a sort of a medium of, of demobilization. And with the, with the um, public uh, television, with Romatska TV, with Ukraine Today and so on, I think that there will be a lot of change and that will be de developing. Lots of these things that are happening in, in, in Ukraine now are rather unprofessional. There is a there are the, um, lots of little groups that have this or that, that project, and it's not so far creating something that would really um, would really affect be effective in uh, in standing against the, this massive Russian uh, information war with Russia today, roughly uh, the um, uh, voice of Russia and so on. So they would have to organize, but you know that's exactly the revolution that is now happening. Uh, well, two quick points. One is, uh, is, this is not social media, well, when it comes to the internet information, Ukraine is just extraordinary. Ukrainska Pravda and Zirka and Idelia that I uh, read regularly, you have, uh, I don't know another country that has such good uh, 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 reporting as, uh, as they have. Uh, and uh, it's very accurate. Uh, they have very high integrity and st uh, standard. So this is totally outstanding. And Tim Snyder has made uh, uh, this point that Ukraine has the best Russia-speaking media by far, and they are far superior to anything that comes uh, is produced in Russia when it comes to uh, truth and cr uh, critical uh, thinking. The other point about uh, which uh, Thane posed to Kiev, I would say that uh, I was rather shocked that uh, these crooks in, uh, in the opposition bloc uh, could get uh, so many votes that they got, uh, was it 9.4 percent in the end. And this is Yuri Boyko, the Minister of Energy, who's revealed to have stolen hundreds of millions as Minister of Energy. And it's uh, Lovetsky, and it's uh, uh, Zahilsky, uh, the old uh, uh, real creator of a big corruption in Ukraine, who even under Kuchma had to flee uh, to Israel for three years uh, because of his uh, uh, crimes uh, in 93 and 94, when he was accused of having stolen $200 million. So uh, uh, I thought it was more shocking that they got votes, and uh, I found it quite understandable that new organizations have not been formed. Thank you. Um, first thing is on the question of um, Svoboda and the far right, by the way. I think opinion polls, from what I understand in, um, in Ukraine, show that Ukrainians differentiate between Putin and Russians, and that's not the case in, in Russia. In Russia, state propaganda is against Ukrainians, the ones who are pro-Euromaidan and, and pro-Western are fascists. And so that state propaganda has turned a huge number of people in Russia against Ukrainians in, in general, whereas opinion polls in Ukraine show that Ukrainians differentiate between the Russian people, who there isn't hostility towards, and if there was, Svoboda and private sector would get more votes, 
um, but there's hostility to Putin. Putin now is the most disliked politician with negative ratings in Ukraine, something like 78% dislike him, yes. Um, so I think that, that's the difference between, between the, the two countries and probably the reason. It's not just Svoboda went downhill, it's Batkivshina. Both Batkivshina and Svoboda need an enemy, and that enemy is gone, Yanukovych is gone. Uh, when he was around, they could get votes because they were the main fighters against Yanukovych. Um, and you, but you can't get those votes fighting against Russia because that anti-Russianism isn't prevalent throughout society. It's anti-Putinism. Uh, on the question of civil society, I, all I would just throw in there is that um, surely you can't compare other examples of civil society going up and down with this because you have a war on. And so many of these civil society groups are mobilized on the basis of providing resources to, say, volunteer battalions, another, uh, which the state can't do because the state is in such, in such a bad state. So there isn't possibility of demobilization because of that. Um, on the question of social media, I'll just throw out that it's more, it is more complicated, as Andreas has said. There are six times more um, members of Verkontaktia in Ukraine than there are Facebook. And Verkontaktia in um, is now run by Putin's people since January of this year. So that makes it even more confusing about social media because um, especially with the new legislation in Russia that everybody who, has, uh, who is a member of Twitter or the Contacti has to give lots of details. So that presumably means the Ukrainians who are members of the Contacti. So it's, it's a far more confusing picture which hasn't done much research. There is an article in the recent post-Soviet affairs on the Contacti in Ukraine which I would point out and might give stress some light, but there's been no research on this. Thanks. Uh, I'll take the chair's prerogative and give the last word. Uh, so in response to Thane's question, this last parliamentary election had the lowest turnout of any election in Ukraine, and not simply because of the loss of Crimea and parts of the Donbass. Even in the areas that voted, the turnout was lower than any previous election. So this also speaks to a certain extent to Harley Balzer's question. There's been significant demobilization. Uh, at least in electoral terms in Ukraine. And it is not just a general demobilization. It is parts of the South and East of the country not taking part in elections and potentially choosing other means to, to be represented in national politics. And that gets at the core question on the domestic front that I see, which is the problem of retaining Ukraine's territorial integrity. And this is not just a question of Russian aggression, uh, although they have external help in losing their territorial integrity. There's no question about that. Uh, but it's ever since the beginning, since the European Association Agreement, uh, the Maidan, there's been a failure to incorporate the South and the East. The South and the East of the country were generally opposed to the Association Agreement. They were generally opposed to the Maidan. They were generally opposed to the government that took power after the Maidan. And they have continued to be opposed to the government in the post-Maidan uh, period. And that is a problem. Uh, unless these areas are incorporated in some more fundamental way, you know, civil society groups, uh, you know, we have Steve Kotkin out here, you know, uncivil society groups are also very prominent in this part of the world. And it's likely to be resolved through violence. And as Anders pointed out, it's very hard to undertake reforms when you have a giant hole in your budget because you're fighting a civil war. Thank you. And we we'll thank our panelists. <laughs>